Hello, and welcome to the CAP Today webinar for Wednesday, April the 8th, 2020. I'm Bob McGonigal, the publisher of CAP Today, and I'll be your host and moderator for a Q&A session that will for follow our formal presentations. Today's webinar is entitled, Using Respiratory Syndromic Multiplex PCR During the COVID-19 Pandemic. This webinar is made possible through the support of BioFire by BioMerieu, and I'm very grateful for the support of BioFire and BioMerieu. Our speakers today, and I'll say more about them in due course, are Wade Stevenson of BioFire and Dr. Christine Ginocchio, she's with both BioFire Diagnostics and BioMerieu, and we're just delighted to have both of them with us. Now, before I begin, I'm going to need to make some remarks. Many of you may have seen uh, the original event that we had planned today, also sponsored by uh, BioFire, which was implementing multiplex PCR across respiratory sample types. And that was to have been presented by Drs. Burnham and Anderson of the Barnes Jewish Hospital and the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. But like so many of you and your colleagues, both Drs. Burnham and Anderson are so fully absorbed right now in coping with the COVID pandemic in their institutions, so they could not present today. And I'm very grateful both to Wade and Dr. Ginocchio for stepping in and putting together this very topical, hot presentation, a hot topic presentation that we're about to hear. We hope we can bring you the program of the doctors from Barnes Jewish in the near future, so stay posted on that. Now, finally, before I begin the formal webinar, I always like to share some housekeeping notes. First, we recommend that you refresh your browser this helps uh, sync slides and audio optimally. You will see in the lower right-hand corner of your screen a toll-free number, 888-364-8804. We have live help available throughout today's event and webinar, so you can call and get help there. Also, if you have technical questions, you can type them in the Q&A box that you see below the slides. And we have plenty of technical people, again, waiting, standing by to help you if you have any problem with audio or the slides. Of course, the Q&A box is really to be used as well, and very importantly, for your questions and your comments. You type them in, and then we'll see them and I will moderate a question and answer session, time permitting, uh, after the formal presentations. And we anticipate plenty of time and some very lively questions and exchanges, so we'll look forward to that. You should know that the full audio and slides will be posted just as soon as we can put them on on captodayonline.com hopefully just a few days. I know that we have enormous interest in this topic, and uh, many of, of you who could not be here or your colleagues could not be here for this event today can follow up and see it then. Finally, as always, it's very important for me to note that CAP Today does not endorse any products or services that may be mentioned today in today's webinar. My remarks, of course, are my own. They're not to be taken as the official policy of CAP Today or the College of American Pathologists. And once again, I really want to thank BioFire and BioMeria for their support and sponsorship of today's event. And now let us turn to our formal presentation. Our first speaker today is an old friend of mine and colleague. He's Wade Stevenson. He's the Senior VP of Global Marketing for BioFire Diagnostics, and he's going to give us an introduction to the technology and end on a note of some of the COVID-19 activities that uh, you really want to hear about from BioFire Diagnostics. Wade, you may begin. 
Thank you, Bob. Uh, we are certainly highly appreciative of, of both you and CAP today for uh, for hosting and moderating uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you. As Bob mentioned, my assignment today is pretty straightforward. I'm going to quickly introduce um, our audience to BioFire, uh, review our core technology, and then make some brief comments about our response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's jump right into it. Really quickly, uh, a little bit about BioFire. We are the leader in syndromic infectious disease testing. And what is syndromic infectious disease testing? Well, it's a, uh, it's a symptom-driven broad grouping of probable pathogens all related to one infectious disease syndrome uh, into one rapid test. And we package those up into really easy to use uh, testing kits that provide fast and accurate results. Uh, that you would expect uh, from a technology using molecular biology. And we are headquartered in beautiful Salt Lake City, Utah. We have been around for a little over 25 years, and we have seven uh, FDA-cleared syndromic panels uh, on the market today. That's a picture of our instrument platform. It's incredibly easy to use. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the setup looks like. It's fast. Most of our assays run in about an hour, uh, some as quickly as 45 minutes. Highly accurate, and I'll do a really quick review of the biochemistry that allows us to deliver those accurate results. And as I said, comprehensive. Uh, the syndromic approach allows us to test for um, a broad grouping of pathogens associated with the clinical infectious disease syndrome. So really quickly, how it works, all the magic takes place uh, inside of our disposable, uh, which we call a film array pouch. It is, you can think of it as composed of two different uh, subsystems, a reagent storage device that's composed of uh, 12 different chambers that house freeze-dried reagents, everything you need. Uh, to do molecular diagnostics. That is attached to a chemical circuit board, which is made of a flexible mylar material that has a series of channels and chambers that we sometimes call blisters uh, that we can physically manipulate to move reagents uh, around and combine them in, in the ways that we need to. So you can think of that chemical cir circuit board as divided up into three different areas, uh, sample extraction and preparation, and then a first stage multiplex PCR, and then a second stage PCR. And I'll go over uh, that biochemistry here in a couple slides. Before I do, I want to review how, how you set up uh, a run. The first step is to uh, insert that pouch into the loading block and then you use our preloaded hydration injection vial that you insert into the loading port on the right, and there's a vacuum inside that pouch which uh, draws the appropriate amount of hydration solution that reconstitutes all of the freeze-dried reagents. And then you add sample buffer to the sample injection vial. You add your patient sample on top of that, close the lid, and then you invert it uh, three times to ensure appropriate mixing. Unscrew the sample injection vial and inject it into the loading port on the left. And again, there's a vacuum inside the pouch that draws the appropriate amount of sample. And with that, the instrument is ready to set, to set up. You take that pouch out of the loading block and put it into the instrument, enter in the sample ID, the pouch type, and hit go. Everything else takes place inside of the pouch. So the first thing that happens is the sample is moved into the lysis chamber where it gets beat beat, which is just a process where it's physically agitated and pathogens are lysed and it releases all the nucleic acids, which are then bound by new magnetic beads, which are coated by silica. Those magnetic beads bearing the nucleic acids are brought over to the purification chamber, uh, where they're washed 
three times uh, to remove any cellular uh, and viral debris. And then a high pH elution buffer uh, removes those nucleic acids from the magnetic beads. And then those nucleic acids are combined with a reverse transcription uh, step to convert any target RNA to DNA, and that's followed then by a high-order multiplex PCR and a very large volume, um, highly multiplexed uh, PCR where we do anywhere from 40 to 70 uh, PCR reactions altogether. That enriches for our nucleic acids of interest. We stop that after about 20, 25 cycles, and then those products are, first stage PCR products are diluted to remove any remaining PCR primers, and then added to a primerless second master mix, and then aliquoted into each well of that array, and each well of that array uh, comes pre-spotted with a nested primer pair designed to amplify one of the uh, a sequence internal to one of the sequences that uh, could have been amplified in the first stage PCR. We monitor that second stage PCR by uh, a double-stranded DNA binding dye, and then we perform at the end a, a PCR melt to confirm the presence or absence of any assay-specific temperature signatures to confirm uh, products uh, the, the right products or pathogens were either present or absent in that original sample. Of course, everything inside the pouch is hidden to the user after they've set up the run and hit go on the instrument. They come back in an hour and they see the report, which simply lists everything, every pathogen that we tested for and notes whether or not it was detected. So that is uh, a quick introduction to BioFire and our core technology. Now just a couple of quick notes on what we are doing uh, in response to the COVID-19 crisis. We are developing two different assays. The first is a BioFire COVID-19 test. This is a single pathogen test uh, designed to detect just SARS-CoV-2. Um, this work was supported with funds from the US DOD. This test has already received emergency use authorization from the FDA. We are obligated to meet some initial demand first from the DOD, uh, but beginning in the next week or so, we'll be able to make some limited quantities of this test available to uh, clinical labs throughout the world. Uh, but single pathogen assays are, are not really what our, our strong point is. Uh, we, as I've described, really do syndromic testing, these comprehensive panels, uh, well. And so that's where we're, we're going to be moving as a long-term solution. Uh, we are also developing the BioFire Respiratory Panel 2.1, which takes our existing BioFire Respiratory Panel 2, which includes 21 common respiratory pathogens, and we will be adding SARS-CoV-2 to that panel for a total of 22 respiratory pathogens. Um, we are seeking, we will be seeking emergency use authorization from the FDA as soon as we can, and we also intend to get it 510K cleared. Um, so those are the two assays we're developing. Uh, a little bit more detail on the one that is going to be available first, the single pathogen assay. So for the single pathogen uh, COVID-19 test, it is going, the intended use is for the qualitative detection of SARS-CoV-2 from NPS samples and transport media from individuals suspected of COVID-19. We're targeting three genes. We require two of those three to be positive in order to get a detected call, along with two internal controls being valid. If you only get one of three detected, we will give you an equivocal call. And we're also going to provide some external control material for labs uh, so that to support their needs for validation and for ongoing QC. 
And then here is some of the data that we submitted to the FDA for emergency use authorization. You can see the sample sizes are pretty low, about what you would expect for an EUA. Uh, but the, the performance looked really good. 30 out of 30 positive samples showed a, a positive result, and 66 out of 66 negative samples showed a negative result. And the LOD looks like it's pretty good as well. Uh, at 3.3 times 10 to the 2, uh, we had 100% detection, and at a log lower than that, we had 70% detection. So the performance looks good. We're very confident it's going to be a great test for the detection of COVID-19, and we hope to have data soon that show similar performance for the uh, respiratory panel 2.1. So that concludes my comments, and I'll turn it back over to Bob. Thank you. Wade Stevenson, thank you very much. I always enjoy the overview of the technology that we'll be discussing today, and I appreciate your openness about the approvals and uh, the supply chain, because that's been much in everyone's minds. Uh, so thank you very, very much. And now, as we uh, begin to load uh, Dr. Ginocchio's presentation, I want to introduce her. Christine Ginocchio really does not need an introduction in our world. Uh, Dr. Ginocchio is extremely well known. She's been a frequent source and a frequent author. She lectures extensively, and she's uh, participated with us in several webinars over the years. I'm very just pleased that she could join us today, and she's prepared a wonderful presentation for you to hear. Uh, actually, I should add, if there was a single individual I would like to hear on a COVID-19 webinar, on the 8th of April of this year, it would be Dr. Ginocchio. So I'm enormously pleased to introduce Dr. Ginocchio. Christine, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Bob. That was quite a kind introduction. Uh, and good day, everyone on the call. So normally I would start a presentation like this by saying it's really a pleasure to be speaking with you today. But I really would have preferred not to have to give this lecture today. Uh, these are really unprecedented times, and I really want to reach out to all my laboratory and medicine colleagues with great concern and gratitude for everything that you're trying to do. And hopefully um, we'll be able to all get through this together. So I have a few disclaimers. Uh, I am an employee of the Ameria and Biofire Diagnostics. Uh, the information uh, that I provide to you today was, to the best of my knowledge, uh, as of April 3rd. We all know that the pandemic guidelines, clinical and research information is changing at a very, very rapid pace. So if you take a look at this, a great example, this is January 27th. This is the cases of COVID reported um, in China with a little bit more than 10 in some areas. And then uh, this was the slide from April 8th where you see the global reach of it. And when I went online this morning and looked at the Johns Hopkins data, there's now greater than 1.5 million cases uh, reported globally. But of course, we know that's a gross underestimate because those are documented cases with approximately 85,000 deaths. In the United States alone, we've now gone over 400,000 documented cases, again, underreported, with greater than 13,000 deaths. And just yesterday alone, the U.S. had 1,800 fatalities. So when this pandemic started, I started to think a little bit about it, and I remembered certainly back in 2009 when the H1N1 pandemic was, and I thought, well, this will probably be like that. But to me, this is completely different, and it's something that hopefully none of us will see again in our lifetimes. So I please um, encourage everybody to refer to the local, state, federal, CDC, WHO websites for up-to-date information as all of this is changing extremely rapidly. The coronaviruses are RNA viruses. They have genomes of about 25 to 32 killer bases. This form means subgroups, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. The human coronaviruses have been known for quite a while. They were first identified in the mid-1960s 
And when we think of them, we think mostly of the four common coronaviruses. So 229E, NL63, they're alpha coronaviruses, OC43 and HKU1, which are beta coronaviruses. Now, those coronaviruses are commonly present on most of the syndromic respiratory panels. So those four viruses are detected by our RP1.7 and our RP2 tests. The other human coronaviruses, if you remember back in 2003, we had the first episode of what we called Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS. Now, that's become the SARS-1 virus. And miraculously, after containment, that virus simply disappeared. But in 2012 to the present, we had the emergence of a new coronavirus. That's the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS coronavirus, which continues to circulate in that region and has a very significant mortality associated with that. And the detection of the MERS coronavirus um, is available on our RP2 Plus panel. If you take a look at the picture of the coronavirus that's here, I show that because there are some very, very important uh, proteins that are listed, um, a lot of them relating to the outer membrane and the spike. So the membrane proteins, the nucleocapsid protein, spike protein, envelope proteins, very critical for um, human cell invasion, entry, and also important when we get to the diagnostics um, for coronavirus. This is the landmark paper describing um, the identification of the novel coronavirus from the patients in Wuhan, China. If you take a look at the pictures to the left, these are electron microscopy. You can see the viral particles. And if you look clearly, you can see the little spikes or what we call the crown where coronavirus gets its name. In the EM picture to the right of that, you can see the coronavirus with the, ass, uh, with the arrows uh, present in uh, lung tissue. On the right is the phylogenetic analysis of the initial isolates identified uh, during the outbreak. And what you see here in red, these were uh, the original uh, coronaviruses identified in Wuhan. And they're very, very similar to the other bat-like coronaviruses on this tree. The one in blue at the top is the SARS-1 coronavirus. So quickly they knew that these were a highly related family that probably originated um, from bats. A very intriguing paper by Anderson et al. talks about the possible origins of the virus in two different scenarios. So in scenario one, they believe the virus may have evolved to its current pathogenic state through natural selection in a non-human host and then jump to humans. Both distinctive features of the SARS uh, coronavirus 2 spikes protein would then have evolved to their current state prior to entering into humans. And those are the receptor binding domain, the RBD portion that binds to cells, and the cleavage site that opens the virus up. So the current epidemic would probably have emerged rapidly as soon as humans were infected, as the virus would have um, evolved these features and then make it pathogenic and then spread between different people. In the second scenario, a non-pathogenic version of the virus jumped from an animal host to humans and then evolved to its current pathogenic state within the human population. So given the similarity of the COV2 to bat um, coronaviruses, so it may have originally come from a bat, went into an immediate uh, intermediary host of some type, and then it jumped to humans. So some coronaviruses from this creature that I have here called, I didn't even know what it was, a pangolin. These are armadillo-like mammals found in Asia and Africa, and they have an RBD structure that's very similar to that of the SARS-CoV-2. These type of pangolins are illegally imported into Guangdong province, and they contain coronaviruses that are very similar to the COV-2. 
So a coronavirus from a pangolin could possibly have been transmitted to a human either directly or through an intermediary host such as civets or ferrets, which we um, believe were linked to the SARS-1 outbreak. Then the SARS-2 coronavirus, um, the cleavage site would have evolved within the human host, possibly be a limited, undetected circulation in the population prior to the beginning of the pandemic. So now in this case, you see humans being the, uh, the reservoir for one of the changes, becoming highly infectious and contagious, and then spreading into the general population. We know that both SARS-CoV enter the cell via the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or the ACE2 receptor. They predominantly infect the lower airways, uh, binds to the ACE2 on alveolar epithelial cells. Both of these viruses are very potent inducers of inflammatory cytokines. And we know that although cytokines are very good, cytokines can be very bad when they're unregulated. And they can lead to cytokine storm or cytokine cascade, which is postulated to be the mechanism for extreme organ damage that we saw and initially identified in the SARS-1 outbreak. How did the virus spread? There are a number of different theories. In the first theory, it seemed to have had occurred initially in the Wuhan seafood market, where we originally thought this might be the sole source of the virus. So early in January, uh, the Chinese CDC collected environmental samples. None were from animals, however. Out of the 33, uh, there were 31 that tested positive. They were from where many of the animals were sold. So therefore, the CDC concluded, uh, the Chinese CDC, that this was evidence that the virus had been transmitted from animals in the market to humans in the market. And you can just see here some pictures of the varying exotic animals um, that are kept in the market. And unfortunately, because of the timing of the outbreak, it was right before uh, the beginning of Chinese New Year, where a lot of people were preparing to have a lot of family celebrations and parties, and a lot of these delicacies are highly sought after uh, for the Chinese New Year. In theory, too, uh, this is based on the fact that there's evidence that human-to-human -human transmission had occurred among close contacts since the middle of December. So if we go back and we think about the incubation period um, between uh, being infected and then showing uh, symptoms, then the first human infections may have actually occurred somewhere back in November. So therefore, the virus could have possibly spread silently between people in Wuhan, perhaps elsewhere, before the cluster of cases that were recognized in this now infamous seafood market were discovered in late December. So in this theory, the virus came into that marketplace actually before it came out of the marketplace. And in the last theory, both humans and animals were infected with the virus in this part of the market, and both could have accounted for the positive environmental samples. What are the symptoms and risk factors? Uh, we all know that we look for fever, we look for the presence of cough, and of course, difficulty in breathing. And these can really appear generally anywhere between two and 14 days after exposure to the virus. These two papers were uh, two of the first that described clinical features, the outcomes and the risk factors for developing severe coronavirus infections. So in the first study, there were 41 patients from the uh, very beginning of the outbreak and the second one, 191 patients. But even with small numbers of patients to larger numbers, we see generally that there's a very same theme uh, throughout all of these papers that have described the clinical features. There seems to be a little bit more predominance of male in these studies, 56 and 62%. The median age in the first study was 49, um, the second study 56. And in the initial study, they looked at how many of those patients had visited um, the seafood market. And you can see those in red had had contact in the seafood market, but there were also ones that did not have any exposure there at that time. 
Common uh, symptoms at the onset of the illness were fever, cough, myalgias, uh, fatigue, sputum production, and in a very small case, diarrhea. Respiratory failure uh, developed in about 50% or more of the patients. Some of them had lymphopenia. And complications included things such as acute respiratory distress syndrome, sepsis, acute cardiac injury, acute kidney injury, and secondary infections. What I think one of the notable features of this disease, if you take a look at the timeline here, is the time really when People first develop symptoms when they become critically ill. So in this study, it was about eight days before people actually sought hospitalization. It was a little bit longer until they required ICU uh, care. And then it was a little bit over 10 days that they actually required intubation. And I think this tells a very serious story in that we tend to think of most viral infections within about a week, you start to feel better, particularly when you have influenza. But in many of these cases, the severity really um, impacts the patients longer after that first week. So we need to be really, really careful in monitoring those symptoms within the first week because patients can rapidly deteriorate as they progress um, into later dates. Um, in both of these studies, about 30, 25 to 30 percent of the patients were admitted to an ICU, and of those, 15 to 28 percent died. And you can see here in the graph the distribution between hospitalized and ICU patients. Very importantly, 48 percent had a comorbidity, and we'll talk more about that. And other risk factors that were identified were a high SOFA score and also a D-dimer that was greater than one microgram per ml. The imaging studies in adults tend to be very classical uh, presentation. On a chest CT, there's about 60% of the patients show consolidation. Very common, 71%, the ground glass opacities, the speckling that you can see on the scans and generally bilateral pulmonary infiltration in 75% of the patients. When you take a look at a normal chest X-ray that's present here, and then you take a look at those, this is one of the initial patients in the study. You can see the bilateral involvement. You can see almost the complete weeding out of the patient's lung as the pa patient progresses over time. This by Yang, uh, was a systematic review and a meta-analysis of over 46,000 patients to take a look at the common symptoms again and what were the most prevalent comorbidities. So fever, cough, fatigue, and dyspnea, like we saw in all of the other studies. And the key comorbidities leading to more serious disease was hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular, and respiratory tract disease. This study was just recently published by the CDC COVID-19 response team, and they looked at severe outcomes among patients in the United States uh, from the beginning around February 12th through March 16th. The data was collected from almost all states in the, uh, in the U.S. They had approximately 2,500 patients with known age. If you take a look at the chart on the left, luckily you can see that in that zero to 19 age group, it was extremely low, only about 5% of the cases occurring in that age group. Quite a significant number of cases in the age groups uh, 20 to 44, 45 to 54, and 55 to 64. And again, a spike in that little bit older group, 65 to 74. So a large number of cases within that younger age group. But if you take a look at the figure on the right, what I have highlighted in red is the key factor that if you take a look at the number of persons hospitalized, admitted to the ICU, or who died among the total in each age group, while there were less patients in the older age groups, they certainly had more serious illness. So the rates of hospitalization, once you hit that greater than 65, go up dramatically, ICU admission and case fatality. 
with certainly very high numbers in those over 85 years of age, with hospitalization ranging 31 to 70 percent, ICU admission 6.3 to 29 percent, and case fatality 10 percent to almost 30 percent. Overall, if you look at what that occurrence is among all ages, you look at the case fatality rate, it's about 2 to about 3.5%. So we have to be extremely careful, of course, within the older age groups that, of course, are at a much higher risk for also having comorbidities. The CDC COVID-19 response team also published um, their preliminary results, look at underlying health conditions and risk factors for more severe outcomes. And they had about 7,000 patients out of the whole cohort where they had this information. And again, you can see it follows very closely along. One or more co uh, morbid conditions in about 38% of the patients with diabetes, chronic lung disease, and cardiovascular being very important. And again, these conditions have a very high impact on whether or not the patient requires hospitalization, ICU admission also. This study by Wolfelt took a look at the virological assessment of the hospitalized patients with coronavirus. And for those of us as virologists, this is extremely important information when we think about diagnostics and what are the, the best ways in order to be able to make that rapid diagnosis. So in this study, they found that there were very high levels of virus admitted from both throat and uh, nasal pharyngeal swabs from the earliest points in the illness. And unfortunately, a lot of this time, this is when people are generally still going about their daily routine activities. If you take a look at the graph on the right, you can see uh, the log RNA copies from the date of uh, onset of illness, extremely high early in the beginning, and then, of course, beginning to wane down as the, as the illness um, starts to resolve. What was very interesting was that people were admitting greater than a thousand times more virus than during the peak shedding of SARS-1. And maybe perhaps this explains the fact why this virus spread so rapidly. SARS-1 was able to be contained after about 8,000 cases, and the global count for SARS-2 is really, like I said, it's top more than a million, and there'll be many, many more cases. So the early and potentially highly effective transmission of the virus occurs um, before clinical symptoms or in conjunction with the very first mild symptoms, so making people very early on highly infectious. In their study, they found that viral shedding dropped after about five days, except in patients with pneumonia. Uh, people with mild infections can still test positive days or weeks after illness. Those mildly sick are likely not still infectious by about roughly 10 days after symptoms start. They also looked at the development of antibodies, uh, which typically occurs about 6 to 12 days and the rapid rise of antibodies, they believe, may explain why about 80% of the people infected with the virus do not develop severe disease. How do we test for SARS-CoV? Um, this has been extremely difficult for everybody in the field, not only the testing, but with limited testing, determining who are the best persons that should be tested. So these are the IDSA testing recommendations. Um, this was updated 319. Again, refer back to them. This may change. So their tier one are persons with signs and symptoms compatible with lower respiratory tract illness. So certainly critically ill patients receiving ICU care. If you've had a close contact with a laboratory confirmed case within 14 days or the history of travel within 14 days uh, to an area where they have sustained community transmission. Uh, because of those underlying risk factors, patients that are immunosuppressed, including HIV, the elderly, or underlying chronic health conditions. And then persons critical to the pandemic response, including our very important healthcare workers, public health officials, and other essential leaders. In Tier 2, again, persons with signs and symptoms who are hospitalized but non-ICU and long-term care residents. 
in tier three in the outpatient setting, people who would normally meet the uh, criteria for influenza testing. So that would be people with comorbid conditions like diabetes, COPD, congestive heart failure, pregnant women, and symptomatic children with risk factors, and particularly um, things like asthma. And then finally, in tier four, that would be community surveillance as directed by public health or infectious disease authorities. Now, this slide shows the CDC testing recommendations. They're really quite similar. They're just categorized a little bit differently. So their top priority is to ensure optimal care for hospitalized patients, lessen the risk of nosocomial infections, and maintain the integrity of our healthcare system. So hospitalized patients and, of course, symptomatic healthcare workers. And then in the second uh, priority, those would be the patients at the highest risk of complications. We need to rapidly identify them and triage them a little bit differently. So patients in long-term care facilities, patients 65 years or age or older, those with underlying conditions, and of course, first responders with symptoms. And then priority three, again, as resources allow, um, persons with, uh, that are needed for critical infrastructure, healthcare workers and first responders, other individuals not meeting the above categories, but symptomatic, and individuals with mild symptoms in communities that are experiencing high levels of COVID hospitalizations. And of course, the non-priority is individuals without symptoms. This uh, study uh, by Lippi uh, looked at when is the best time to test and what's the test probability of being accurate. So this looks at potential pre-analytical analytical variables. A very nice graph here that you can see is that was, certainly we have that window of false negatives. Uh, when a patient is first infected, they may be shedding very, very low levels of virus, but they may be still infectious. So we know that the tests generally um, are positive by the time symptom onset occurs. They tend to peak at that five to seven day range. They begin to come down. And after symptom relief is when we tend to find that the, the tests become uh, PCR negative. So based upon a number of these studies, uh, the CDC now has come out with updated guidelines on what are the optimal specimens for testing. So if we take a look at upper respiratory tract specimens, the preferred one now is a nasal pharyngeal swab. In the very beginning, we were encouraged to test both nasal pharyngeal and oropharyngeal because there were early reports that oropharyngeal may be better. But based upon uh, uh, several studies, two of the ones which I list here, the now the preferred is a nasopharyngeal swab. If you take a look at the graph on the left, that's nasal swabs. The middle graph is one on throat swabs. And you could take a look at the CT values, which will reflect uh, the amount of, of virus from the day of onset. And you can see here uh, that the nasal swabs um, tend to have a, a better recommendation um, for uh, being positive. But again, throat swabs can also be um, extremely helpful in making that um, identification also. But if you have to choice, uh, nasal swabs tend to have lower CT values, indicating overall, if you take a look at graph C on the right, um, having higher levels of virus present in the particular sample. Other acceptable alternatives are, of course, our oral pharyngeal uh, collected by a healthcare professional, uh, nasal midturbinate uh, swab collected via by a healthcare professional, or using uh, on site self collected uh, using a flock tapered swab. Anterior nares collected by a healthcare professional or on site self collected using a round uh, foam swab. Uh, for nasal swabs, a single polyester swab with a plastic shaft should be used to sample both nares, nasal swabs, or uh, mid-turbinate swabs. They should be placed in transport tube containing either viral transport media, Amy's transport, or sterile saline. 
And I know these are great recommendations, but one of the biggest problems everybody has had is getting swabs and getting transport media. And uh, the FDA, uh, if you go to their website, they've addressed alternatives that can be used with the different COVID tests uh, to make sure that this is available because there is an extremely limited amount, uh, particularly of viral transport media, that is now currently available. If both an MP and an OP swab are collected, uh, which is great, um, that would be very beneficial, but they should be combined in a single tube to maximize test sensitivity and limit testing resources. And the one thing that we have to keep in mind, even though we may be a little bit desperate for swabs, is that you should not be using calcium alginate or swabs with wooden shafts, as they have been shown, not with all assays, but with some, have been inhibitory uh, to PCR. If we take a look at lower respiratory tract samples, if a patient has a productive cough, uh, sputum is quite sensitive for the detection of uh, COVID-2. They do not recommend induction of sputum um, for safety reasons. And then when clinically indicated, if the patient's on mechanical ventilation, uh, a lower respiratory tract aspirate or a BAL could be collected and tested. And then just some recommendations for storage for all type of samples, refrigeration for up to 72 hours, and to freeze the sample if there's going to be any significant delay in testing. So what about all these assays? How good are they? Are they all comparable? And I think we have some idea, but I think at the end of the pandemic, we'll have a huge amount of data on the actual performance of these assays, much like we did during the pandemic in 2009. This was an excellent paper that just came out by Vogels, where they compared the analytic efficiencies and sensitivities of four of the original, most common uh, assays. One was from the China CDC, one was from the US CDC, uh, one was from the Berlin Institute of Virology from Christian Drosten's laboratory, and the last one is the Hong Kong University one. So they looked at, this is uh, nine different primer sets. You can see the location on the, um, uh, on the diagram to the right. So they used RNA transcripts, full-length RNA. They used spike samples to do this evaluation. And what you can see here, these are tensile serial dilutions that all of the assays can detect. Um, they can detect the virus, and that's clearly shown in figure A and B. However, what you need to take a note as, in the one in figure A is the one in the lighter pinkish color, um, that the CT values are significantly higher than the others. And that's one of the, that's the RDRP SARS assay uh, from the Berlin Institute of Virology. If they took a look at overall of the amplification efficiencies of the assay in figure C, they're both, they're all about greater than 90%. Uh, all have similar sensitivity among the primer probe sets, with the exception of this one uh, primer set that's listed. Interesting, they also looked at the ability of these different assays to differentiate between true negatives and true positives when there's low amounts of virus that's present. And on the graph on the left, you see the ones from Berlin, uh, Hong Kong, on the right, China CDC, US CDC. And what I want to point out is that in the mock and the first solution, we would expect the samples to be negative. And then the 10 to the 1, the 10 to the 2, where we start to see detection um, at very, very low levels. If you take a look at the one assay that I described, you see that it's negative um, across all of these, um, which is um, much lower sensitivity than what we see with the other pairs that are shown here. However, we also have to be careful because there is background and non-specificity with some of the assays. And the one from the China CDC, the boxes in red you see in the mock that should be negative. You see uh, low level, supposedly low level detections being picked up. And also in the CDC assay two and in the CDC assay three. So uh, we have to continue to evaluate uh, these assays as we go through the pandemic. Uh, we have to understand these assay targets and also keep in mind that these are RNA viruses and they like to mutate and this could uh, affect everybody's assay within a couple of months. 
So there are a number of different SARS uh, testing options. You should refer to the FDA EU website for the approved test. I started to make a list, and it changes every single day. So you should refer there on a regular basis. There are rapid antigen direct tests um, that are rapid, can be used point of care. There are rapid antibody tests. However, they do not need EUA if they're just for um, epidemiology. EUA approval is only required if they're being used for diagnosis. They're rapid. They can be done maybe point of care. But the question with those is really sensitivity and the time to antibody production, which could be delayed certainly in patients giving a false negative for a diagnosis. But I think in the future, they'll be extremely important for us to take a look at epidemiology, to take a look at true transmission rates. And antibody tests are going to be very important for us to take a look at who actually was infected, who has protective antibodies, because I have a feeling that we're not going to be done with this virus in one wave. This virus will come back in a second wave and in a third wave. And we really need to know what's the risk and what is the levels of herd immunity. There are molecular diagnostics, single tests only for COVID-2. Again, there can be there's some rapid. There's going to be point of care. We have molecular diagnostics again on the COVID-2 on very high throughput batch or random access platforms that are terrific for large scale testing. And then we're going to have the syndromic panels, like uh, uh, Wade mentioned, uh, where we have COVID-2 now as part of that complete um, complex um, diagnosis. So what's the role of syndromic testing in this approach? Well, we know now that we need to identify COVID-19. That's really important. So that's certainly within our first line. But what about all the other pathogens circulating? There are quite a number of pathogens. So if you take a look at this is the biofire syndromic trends. This is over three seasons. The last season is the peak on the right the different colors of the different viral classes, and at any time during any peak respiratory season, there are, every virus is circulating, some at significantly high levels, and a lot of these viruses continue to circulate all year. And this is actually the, the other coronaviruses, the four common coronaviruses. They peak in the winter months the same as the other viruses like influenza, RSV, and metanumo. And they usually account for about 10% of the uh, circulating viruses. And which of the coronavirus it is can vary depending upon the year. So you could see that in the center graph, the predominant virus um, was OC43, where this year it was HKU1. So we need to keep that in mind. There's a lot of other pathogens that are circulating. What about co-infections? We know that all the viruses can be present in co-infections. Adenovirus, interestingly, being one of the most common. But if you take a look at the third bar from the left, you see that coronaviruses, the other coronaviruses, are very commonly found in co-infections. And this is something that we need to learn and understand about COVID-2. So now a first line, it can be really defined by a patient population. So you can complement with the BioFire RP1.7 or 2.0 syndromic panels if they're COVID-19 negative and or if COVID-19 positive, and this additional information can immediately support additional treatment and or isolation information. We know very little right now, fortunately, about co-infections with COVID-2. Unfortunately, most of the studies coming out of China, uh, they did not do cultures or other viral testing. I think a lot more of that information will come out as we get more data from Europe and the United States. But these are a couple of pay, uh, uh, papers that have been published. Uh, one study uh, from China, there were 104 samples that were positive for COVID-2. Six of those had co-infections with other coronaviruses, three cases, influenza A, rhinovirus, and influenza A, H3. A lot of these patients that didn't have COD had other viruses, so it was, it was helpful to be able to make that alternative diagnosis. There's been mycoplasma uh, identified with COVID-19, and mycoplasma would require macrolide treatment. Influenza A, and an unpublished study, but in a, a preliminary analysis by Ian Brown at Stanford School of Medicine, they found that about one in five people with COVID-19 will also be infected with other respiratory viruses. 
The other thing I think that we need to think about really carefully is what is going to be the risk for secondary bacterial infections. We have a lot of patients that are on ventilators, and the longer you're on a ventilator, we know that you have a much higher risk for developing a secondary infection. Unfortunately, again, very limited data. One study uh, showed that four out of 13 patients in the ICU developed a secondary infection, but they did not give uh, the causes of those infections. And then another limited study where one patient had a super infection with Klebsiella pneumoniae, Asnidobacter, and Aspergillus. So as we know they have COVID-19, we also have to be wary of the fact that we have to be able to deal with secondary infections, and in particular, secondary infections in the hospital that could be highly um, multidrug resistant. So this is where, again, another very good complementary test would be the biofire pneumonia panel for those patients at risk for these secondary infections or in the ICU on a ventilator. So this is the pneumonia panel. Um, the bacteria are reported in semi-quantitative long bins that are listed on the left, the most common causes of community, hospital, and ventilator-associated pneumonia. The atypical pathogens um, included in that is the mycoplasma that we've already seen with uh, the coronavirus and all the normal viruses that could also be related to co-infections, along with very key resistance markers that would be important in deciding what type of uh, antibiotic therapy these patients may also need to be placed on, and with very good high positive and negative predictive values. So another tool that unfortunately we may have to employ at these patients are in the hospital, are in ICU, are on ventilators with extremely high risk for secondary infection. So with that, I'd like to stop. Um, I wish everyone uh, safety, so please be safe and please stay healthy, uh, you and your families and all your coworkers. Thank you. Dr. Ginocchio, I want to thank you. That was a masterful presentation from yes. Alpha to Omega. Thank you so much for that. We'll now turn to some questions and answers. As you know, these uh, webinars are scheduled for one hour, and we're right at the top of the hour. But if you don't mind, in the audience, I'm going to uh, spill over. We have a few minutes in addition that we can use. And uh, I'm going to begin uh, with you, Wade, while I let Christine catch her breath. We had some questions regarding uh, equivocal results in this question of do you get one of three targets, positive being equivocal? Could you uh, elaborate on that a little bit for us? This was from one of what your presentations. Right yeah, there. for sure. It's a it's a great question. So yes, in the in the single pathogen COVID nineteen test, if only one out of the three pathogen or gene targets comes up positive, you will get an equivocal result. <clears throat> Pardon me. So the very, very, the most likely uh, situation when that happens, and we don't expect that to happen very often, uh, but the, ver the most likely explanation is you have a, a very low titer positive. So if you look at that bottom uh, graph graphic down there, you can see that you know we didn't get any equivocals at even the LOD. It was only below uh, LOD. Uh, that we got five out of those 20 samples to give a, a, an equivocal result. So when that does happen, in the rare case that that happens, we do recommend a retest. And if your second retest is either positive or equivocal, we, we feel confident in recommending that that patient specimen is positive for COVID-19. And then one further comment for RP2.1, we are designing it in such a way that we will avoid uh, completely making any equivocal calls, and that's uh, based on guidance from the FDA. And to Christine's earlier point, the standards and guidance are changing on a weekly basis. Uh, the, in just a few short weeks that have elapsed between the development of the, the, the single pathogen COVID-19 test and the respiratory panel 2.1, uh, their guidance has changed on this issue. And so we'll be able to develop uh, the respiratory 2.1 panel in such a way that you will never get uh, an equivocal call. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I'm going to direct the next question to Christine, and uh, it's an issue I'm sure it's on everybody's mind as we think about safety in the laboratory. How much mm -hmm. exposure and personal protective equipment are needed when handling uh, samples for use with this uh, biofire test, in particular inverting the tube? Do you recommend that it be done under a hood? Well, I would always recommend any sample processing is done in a hood if it's physically possible. Um, the recommendations currently are that if you can process in a BSL-2 hood, you should. That would be the safety for the handler, the technologist that's going to process the sample. But if that is not available, and that will be in many cases, that as long as you use an appropriate shield, uh, to separate you from the handling of the specimen. And when I say a shield, you want a full face protection so that nothing could be splashed into a mucous membrane, that that could also be done that way. Of course, wearing appropriate PPE to protect yourself also. So for the film array panels, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not essential. We have a test that are clear wave that can be done in a physician's office that you do it um, in a BSL-2 hood. But with handling these samples, uh, you should if you can. Uh, but if you cannot do it, then as long as you use an appropriate shield, an appropriate PPE, it can be handled in that manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wade, let me ask you a question. Uh, are you planning then to add the uh, COVID, uh, COVID-2 test to the RP2 Plus panel as well once it's ready? for approval? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. And just uh, let me give a little bit of a definition there. Um, so outside of the United States, we currently uh, market a test called the RP2 Plus panel, which includes the MERS coronavirus. But because the MERS coronavirus circulates at such a such a low, almost non-existent level here in the U.S., uh, we sell RP2, which does not include uh, the MERS coronavirus. So our plan for RP2.1 is we will have uh, a version here in the U.S. Uh, that adds the SARS-CoV-2 uh, assay, but does not include the MERS coronavirus. But for several markets outside of the U.S., where MERS continues to circulate at, at, a, at a low uh, but detectable level, uh, such as uh, several countries in Europe, obviously the Middle East, South Korea, we will sell a version of RP2.1 Plus that includes MERS as well as SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. Thank you very much. Along with that uh, question on RP2, while we're on the topic, we had a question, once the 2.1 is approved, will they automatically replace the RP2, or will we need to order those separately from you? That's for Wade. So that's a, an, another great question. Uh, it, it will not automatically replace RP2, uh, but we anticipate that most of the demand will shift to RP2.1, and so the, we will, most of our manufacturing will, will, in anticipation of that demand, shift towards manufacturing RP2.1, and so we will encourage our customers uh, to make that transition, but it will be a, a different part number, uh, and you won't automatically be transitioned. You'll have to um, go through a validation. It will be a separate uh, part number that you'll have to order, and uh, there will be some software updates so that you have the right uh, software modules on, on your system that will allow you to report the results from RP2.1. Thank you very much. And just quickly, uh, talk a little bit about throughput, because as we see the uh, great needs for testing, talk a little bit about the BioFire film array throughput and how you deal with the various volumes in various laboratories in your recommendations. Yeah, it's uh, that's, a, that's another great question. So with, uh, with the, f the 
the film ray torch system, it's it's modular. You can have anywhere from two to twelve different uh, units, and if you ha and each one can run a, a pouch an hour uh, approximately. So with a, a torch twelve, you'd be able to, to test twelve patient samples an hour, uh, roughly. And depending on how many hours a day your your lab is open, you can do the math to figure out what your your daily uh, throughput would be. Uh, we have several large, very large uh, laboratories who have multiple torch units, and so you can certainly go beyond 12. Uh, but the point is, your your throughput is going to be constrained by uh, the number of instrument units that you have in your laboratory. Thank you very much. And now let me turn to uh, Christine Ginocchio for our next question, uh, and that's as follows. How likely is persistent SARS-CoV-2 positivity, persistent positivity following symptom resolution due to infectious variants? Mm. Uh, great question. Um, I don't think we know 100% the answer to that. Um, we do know that the virus you can still detect it sometimes uh, after resolution of symptoms for a number of days. Uh, but if you detect it by RT-PCR, we really don't know if that's a dead or live virus. Uh, studies looking at cultured virus over time, um, that was not really, there was not really a lot of data that came out of that um, from China. Um, so I don't think I can give you a really good answer yet on once you're symptom-free. Uh, we usually go by um, the CDC recommendations that uh, should be a minimum of seven days since symptom onset, three days um, without um, any symptoms whatsoever, meaning no fever, uh, resolution, and, and other things just to be on the safe side. Um, and they believe that at that point you're probably not infectious anymore. Um, there will be some people with persistent shedding. Um, children may be ones with persistent shedding. Some children uh, are infected and are not even symptomatic at all. So I think the natural history of that is going to be very interesting, um, but I don't think we know exactly what that time would be uh, currently. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, as you might imagine, we've got an enormous amount of questions regarding specimen procurement, specimen handling, et cetera. I can address as many as I can here. I'll address as many as we have a chance. One important question I'd like to have you clarify for us, if you will, Christine, uh, the question is as follows. We hear saliva may be a good sample type. Do you have any data about this, or do you have any views about saliva as a specimen type? Mm. I can't remember the reference because I've probably read 500 papers in the last, or more than that, in the last couple of weeks. But there is a publication that I just saw or was referenced where they did look at saliva. Now, I don't know what that data is offhand. But at the end of it, they did not recommend saliva, that they found that the sensitivity uh, was not going to be as good as a, say, a nasal pharyngeal swab or in combination with an oral pharyngeal. It might be a convenient sample type if you don't have swabs, and it probably could be used, but in this one study that I've read, it did not have appropriate sensitivity. Now, that was a single study, so there could be conflicting results depending upon the study, depending on how the test was done, depending upon the sensitivity of the assay. If you have a very highly sensitive assay, saliva might be uh, more appropriate than with an assay that is a log less sensitive. So um, it has been thought about, and there is data out there, um, but as I recall, it was not recommended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me follow up with you and also ask the following question with you, Christine. Can the film array COVID-19 detect SNL strains? In other words, you uh, talked about the mutation <laughs> of the virus. Could you speak yeah. to this question generally for us? 
Yeah. It's it's very interesting. Um, I had a really nice um, minimal spanning tree graph of the two different strains of the virus. Um, and when we do our uh, genetic analysis to determine uh, where the best uh, primers uh, that need to be used to detect the virus, we've gone through hundreds of sequences, every sequence that's been uh, put into databases. And in those databases are both strain variants that are in there now. Uh, very clearly, you can see them. They cluster differently, and um, uh, they're separated out. So we do know that the that primers in, in our tests will detect both strains of the virus. Now, that's not to say six months from now, anybody's test could be affected by these continuing this virus as it's evolving. Uh, but based on the current data, yes, we do detect them. Thank you. Thank you very much. One final question for you, which uh, is, struck me as being very interesting. Uh, Dr. Ginocchio, is there any evidence of whether people without spleens are more susceptible <laughs> to infection and complications? Mm, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, people with splenectomies, we tend to think about encapsulated organisms, mostly, you know, bacterial infections that they can't clear um, for that very reason. But I'm trying, when I look at the list of all the comorbidities, I don't actually recall splenectomy as being listed. Um, put, you know, as one of those um, as as one of those risk factors. Now, it may we just don't maybe just don't know yet because of the limited uh, maybe clinical data that's available or the number of patients. But um, I, I really do think that that's a that's really quite an excellent question. Um, but unfortunately, I don't I don't really have the answer to that yet. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we have a great multitude of questions, and I want to assure you that I'm going to share all these questions uh, with the folks at BioFire and BioMiria. As you know, they're very, very dedicated to your needs, and I'm sure you'll all get answers. Also, uh, we have a very active question and answer session, section at CAP today, and if you'd like to address questions to us there, we want to make sure we get each and every question answered. So with that, I think it's about time to uh, wrap up. Obviously, I want to thank, profusely thank Wade Stevenson and Christine Ginocchio for putting this great presentation together for you today. I want to thank BioFire and BioMiria for their sponsorship. Uh, it's been just terrific. Let me also uh, praise a colleague who stays behind the scenes on these things all too often, and that's Tim Wilson. He works and helps me uh, put this on. He's a, he works with uh, Blue Sky. He answers lots of your questions and helps with your technical issues. So I want to give him a tip of the cap. Uh, with that, once again, like I say, I'm going to wrap up with thanks to Wade Stevenson, Christine Ginocchio, to BioFire and BioMiria, and finally to all of you. I know this is a very, very difficult and stressful situation. Uh, it is unprecedented in almost all uh, everyone's professional experience, and we do want you to stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you very much. So we'll bring this webinar now to a close. Thank you very much.